College campus, and I want to give a special thanks to the Native American Alliance students here on this campus for all their great support and help that they've given down at Lyle Point, the Nanbiwakluit. I'd like to let the people know that um, we're still there and that the, we have the continued occupation still alive. And I want to express myself on behalf of the land itself and the development, as you heard Randy speak of of sacred ground 
and the sacred water that's beside it, the Columbia River. <clears throat> and some of you that have not um, been aware of what's going on, we have um, fishing rights down there by Lyle Point. Uh, we have scaffolds there, and our scaffolds have been um, torn down and thrown in the water. And on those scaffolds, we go and get our ceremonial foods. And with the treaty rights, we have foods that we recognize. The first food is the salmon, the meat, and the roots, and the berries. And without our foods, we don't have any medicine. We don't have our way of life about us to carry on for the generations to come. It is a very important part of our life for us to go out and gather these foods and have the access to gather these foods. And so that access is being denied because of the development. And it's very important that um, we continue the occupation. And we're very proud of the support. We're always going with the sacred fire, keeping it burning. It's been going since September 27th. And we've received a lot of good benefits from the fire. We find ourselves in the courtrooms today in federal court um, the Yakima Nation has taken recognition and taken a stand to um, give their legal support. And uh, Warm Springs Confederated Tribes has intervened the issue. So now we're, we are going into the legal court battle. I myself, I feel very sensitive that um, it's been hard for us to not to continue our way of life. My uh, family has been fishing people by the river and they have been gathering this food from the time we've lived there. This food is something that we, we give to our elders. We want to continue that live, live, living that way of life. The, we recognize it as the medicine there. And without it, we can't um, carry on. We can't uh, grow strong. It heals our hearts and our minds. So that's how important it is to us. It has a religious significance. The county itself, Klickitat County, has determined the treaty of 1855 non-significant. And we're fighting it on usual and accustomed fishing grounds under the treaty. So with that, we continue to fight and we continue to struggle. I'm very thankful that um, people have come forward from far and near. We have an estimated 400 Native Americans, a thousand non-Indians that have been through that area. In, their, in, in support of Lyle Point. We've had um, been able to go out and network across the, the nation. We like to let the people know that under the treaty, we recognize, recognize the Yakima, the Warm Springs, the Umatilla, and the Nespers as fishing tribes. They all fish there on those waters. We are being in jeopardy by the windsurfer Windsurf, windsurfing community, you know, they come down there, they play on our waters, they pollute our waters, they have no respect for the water, and without um, that water, we have no life, so it's very important to us, and it's very important that we come out and try to explain to the people that um, we have a responsibility, and with that responsibility, um, we come out and, and let everybody know that we um, we're going to take a stand and we're going to do our best to help our Mother Earth heal, to heal the land and the water. So I want to thank each and every one of you for all your support this evening. Thank you. Going to have a few words with John, uh, Johnny Jackson's going to have a few words too, and um, and uh, I don't know. Here's John. Thanks. Good evening, my people. I'm kind of tired right now, so it's going to be a, a little difficult. I've been awake since four o'clock this morning, but I'm glad to be back here. It's very difficult to explain and try to get people to understand what our traditional ways are and our way of life. And it's a great struggle to try to uh, bring forth 
the way we have unwritten laws in this country that were here before the Americans came. I have uh, a very difficult time in thinking about what is happening, not only on the Columbia River, but throughout this country. Along the Columbia River, it's like uh, little bursts of fire popping up everywhere. We look in different areas. When it comes to people that come from the South and the East, there's never been in Indian country before. I've never been among the Indian people and understood their traditional ways. They feel that their laws are the only laws that exist in this country. But our laws were here before anyone else came and brought their laws here. And our laws were set down by the Creator. He gave us these laws to live by. And we have to abide by them. And I look at the punishment that we can endure is far more greater than looking at answer to our Creator if we violate or misuse our laws. So therefore we have to stand by them. Lyle Point to me and my people is very important. When I look at my traditional elders, I feel that feeling that I'm not doing enough to protect that land. When you know the truth about some land, sometimes you you have to have an understanding with your elders before you can do anything to try to protect it. And myself, I've been like put, put up against the wall and backed as far as I could. And I had to stand up and confront my elders and say, this is, this is the way it's got to be done. We have to get an understanding. We have to talk. I have to know a lot more. And I have to expect a lot more from you elders before I can do anything. Lyle Point is a sacred burial site. When Lewis and Clark first came through down to the Columbia, there were hundreds of Indians, natives along that river on both sides. And wherever the, wherever the tributaries emptied into the river, the main stem, there were villages and people lived there. After Lewis and Clark left and went back east, other people came. And with that, my people started depleting because they confronted sicknesses that they'd never witnessed before. They didn't know how to deal with it. In places, their whole villages died. And if you look back into Lewis and Clark Chronicles and you look through some of the other history following that, you'll find it's there. But my people didn't write it down in no books or they didn't keep that kind of a record. They kept their own record and passed it on from generation to generation. It's like telling their young about a lesson of what had happened and how their people had passed on. 
while villages disappeared and they were buried right where they all passed on. He didn't take guns or wars to kill my people off along the Columbia River. We fought a war, sure. Along the Columbia River, we fought a war. One of my grandfathers was one of them war chiefs that fought there. He also was one that signed the treaty of 1855 under protest. But he got to reserve the right to live along the Columbia River and stay there. He didn't have to go to the reservation. But we were always told that there were certain lands that we couldn't live on or couldn't camp on or use. And Lyle used to be a great fishing point area where the winds blew both ways and was a great place for drying fish and curing the fish. And they made a lot of use of it. It also come a became a place where people used it for docking after the Americans came and brought the steamships. With that, they brought something else to my people that my people didn't understand, did not know about. And I live with that by knowing. When I look back to know that my people stood by helplessly because they weren't educated. They didn't have lawyers like we have today. They didn't have no justice system like we have today. All they could do is watch when they seen their ceremonial grounds uprooted and trampled on, and they were told to move out of the way. They didn't know how to understand, they didn't understand English, they didn't know how to talk back. So with that, they, they just watched what was happening to their people, and they couldn't do nothing about it. If they were fought back, if they had done anything about it, it was a, it was a hostile, hostile act. It was an act of war again. So they just had to leave it alone. The railroad came through right through the burial ground. I proved it, piled it over where it's piled now. We never did live on that land or or do anything with it. We fished around it, and we went around it, but we never built on it. To this day, we're still keeping that law, respecting that law, because our unwritten law, since once we put our dead into the ground, we're never to ever disturb them again never to bother them in any way or move them. They go back to the earth for where, where they came from until he comes and calls them. All this, we didn't need books to, to know this. This was, this was here before the Bible or any, any minister, any, any evangelist or any preacher came along. We already knew this. We already knew that the creator that you call God was there. All the teachings was there, the sweat house, the sacredness of the sweat house, as well as the long house today, the circle. You go to the many parts of this country and you'll find that the native people held it a little different way of practicing their religion and talking to their creator. Hours along the Columbia River is the longhouse, the seven drums, the wash at service, the water, the fish, 
the roots. All that's there, the mountains, is sacred to us. We have laws that we're taught when we're little to respect. When we go up the mountains, we don't we don't go and break trees or pick the plants or do anything. We pick the fruit, we're there, but we don't disturb anything that we're not supposed to. Because that's something that we're taught to respect. As one owner used to say that the Creator put down his word and says, I give you this when I put you down this earth. And I give you this food and I give you these things. You take care of it. If you don't, then I'll take it back. There's no more need for it. So we have to live by that law. But it's very difficult to make other people understand that. It's, make, it's very difficult to make people who want to make millions, who want to build houses, build industry, to go and look at our river. It's just something to use, to uh, pollute and destroy. But to us native people, that river is sacred, not water. It's part of our religion, just like the salmon. Whenever we have a ceremony, like, like my sister said there, that, that salmon has to go on the table, and the water is also on the table. Some of you might come down to the river later on, in April, and you'll witness our salmon feasts. That's given thanks to the first food. We cannot just take the salmon, the first salmon, and eat it or sell it or do anything with it. We have to give thanks for it and feast it first. And we have to have the services, the seven drums. The people will all gather and take that food on that day, on the Sunday. And when we all taste that salmon, then we take protect the water and the rest of the foods that follow it. Then after that, we're free to go ahead and harvest the fish. We don't just catch the fish any time we feel like it. When the new fish come, that we jump in there like anyone else and take it, use it because this is our law. We all live by that. That's our law along the Columbia River, the Yakmos, the Warner Springs, the Umatillas, Naspers. You all know that law now. And we have to respect that. And without that fish, without that water, our elders, aren't very pleased with that. They need that. They won't go to any other, a lot of them won't go to any other kind of church or any other religion because they stand by that law they're committed to. Just like myself, I'll go and witness somewhere else, but I'll come back where I belong. The same way when I go across, go across this country to some other community or tribe, I'll be there to watch them how they, how they practice their religion and what they use, and I respect it and their foods, because this is what the Creator had given us to live by. <coughs> I'd like to say a lot of things about Lyle Point, about the sacredness and what has happened there in the beginning, and why I'm so protective of that land. But it's very difficult to go and bring that out. At this time, I don't feel like going through that. 
we look at the people and we wonder, as I look at you, that if there's any way that they can understand when we say that there's a place that's sacred, that there are many people underneath that ground resting, lying rest, that they could understand and respect it as we understand and we respect all the cemeteries wherever we see a cemetery, regardless to whose cemetery it is or what walk of life that cemetery belongs to, that we respect it. We do not venture in or bother anything there. And we wonder why ours isn't respected. There are many places along the Columbia, such as Lyle Point. As Lewis and Clark said, when he first came past Lewis and Clark, uh, come past Lyle Point, he stopped there for four days and traded with the people. There were hundreds of people there and they were drying fish because the wind blew both ways and that's what it takes to dry fish. My sister here can tell you how much work she puts into it, how she has to watch it and hope that the wind's blowing. She won't put it in where the wind won't hit it because that's the way it has to be cured. That's the way it has to be taken care of. And that's, that was one of the places that the people used for that purpose. And today we're struggling for that over that because a windsurfer comes along and has people with a lot of money standing behind him. Wants to build 33 houses, 33 lots with houses and says that they will respect it. I know myself from experience that it will not be respected. Once a man owns some land, if he doesn't feel that he has to abide by them rules or laws or regulations, he's not going to do it. He feels he can do what he wants with that land because it's his. And that's what we're looking at, what will happen to our river. I hope that you people can understand that the sacredness of all people's rights and their sacred grounds is very important in this life because we look at it this way, that what we do we're always being watched by the Creator. And in our teachings, that if we do do wrong against any of these sacred grounds, regardless of whose it is, we answer to Him. <coughs> our elders didn't know how to read or write, but they, they had this teaching. It says, once, you, once you're gone to that other world, you're going to answer to Him. If you don't go, if you don't do right, then you come back. Your spirit will walk this earth forever till that judgment day. We have to live by that law. And our elders didn't have no Bibles or any other kind of teaching to know that, because they know that teaching only came from our Creator. There are many things that we were taught by our elders that is from wrong and right and we live by that. I'm going to be traveling next month to the national meeting in Wisconsin. Ninth I'll be leaving, I'll be taken this issue with me from from Lyle Point. We have a national council and I'm a council member of that. And then people want to know what's going on at Lyle Point as well as along the Columbia River. As we look at it in our national council, 
is that, that we try to deal with all the fires that are started throughout the country in different areas. It's like the fire we got down there at Lyle Point, a sacred fire that burns day and night. It burns there until we deal with it and, and settle with it. That fire never goes out. And when I get back there, we'll be discussing that fire. There are many fires on, on, in this country, as well as in Canada, Alaska. You know, if we don't, if we don't be careful, we'll be selling bottled water here in this part of the country like they do back where in the East and other places, we wouldn't have that fresh, clean water anymore. When I was back in New York at the conference back there, and I went into a cafe, I paid 35 cents for a glass of water. We're not doing that here yet. That's what happens when you're not careful with the water. So these people, like Henry Spencer, have to be stopped and corrected because what they do here, they don't care. They're going to develop and they're going to leave to get their money and go. They don't have to live with it. You people and your children will have to live with it. They'll have to deal with it. And like we looked at down Portland and the Dells slideshow of what we had once. That's all we have, and that's all our children are going to see. And that's what will happen with these mountains, these rivers. If, there's, if it's not stopped, we lose it. Down New Mexico, when I was down in New Mexico, there's a river that they once enjoyed. It's dead now. They can only look at it and watch it run by their village and run past the other towns. They cannot use it, not even for irrigating. And that's what I that's what I fear that can happen here. So I hope that we can come to a better understanding and try to educate other people as to what we have left the forests, the rivers, the streams. There's a lot of medicine and food out there that we have, as well as the river itself. If we're not careful, one day we're not going to have that. And nobody will want to, nobody will want to live along that river if they can enjoy using it. And we'll lose it forever. It's not, it's not a pretty sight to see people look at a river that they wish they could use and it's not, it's not usable anymore. So I hope that what we're trying to do can wake a lot of people up. It's very important. Water is given to us as part of our lives. It's a part of our life, whether you see it any other way. From the time you're little, the time that you go on to the other world, you're going to use that water. You're going to thirst for it. But you have to take care of it. And the food that's in that water, you have to take care of it. The fish, as we look at it, how sacred it is to us how important it is to us. I don't only speak for my people, I speak for all people. Because whatever happens to them can also happen to us. Whatever happens to their children can also happen to our children. So we have to look at this in a way that we speak for everyone. In my council, we speak for all people now. 
It's not just native anymore. We speak for people of color because everywhere we've gone, we've seen the suffering because of the millionaires, the rich people, the industrialists, the big tycoons that want to build and ravish and take the resources out and leave the rest, leave the spoils to the ones that live there. And they have to take care of it and they have to try to correct it and live with it the best way they can. They don't have to, they don't have to answer for it. It's just the people that they leave behind that, that live in the place have to go and try to do the best they can with it. It's not going to bother them. They make the millions and they leave. And your children have to look at it. Your children have to live with it. And that's not right. So think about that. Think about this timber. This timber is the clean air that you drink and you breathe. Without this timber, you're not going to have no clean air. The wind blows and cleans that air through this timber and all this brush. And we're taught that by our elders. Don't burn the forest. Don't go and cut it out because that's, that's what cleans our air. A lot of this is taught to us when we're little. Even before we start going to school, we start learning this. And that's what we're looking at today and we're facing today. As people that are so hungry for money, they don't care what it costs or who it hurts. They're gonna they're gonna take it. And when they're when they're through, they're gonna leave. And leave it those leave it with those that live there. And that's not right. So I hope that you people can understand. And I lost it. John Trudeau! I'd like to... Uh... First of all, thank you for being here. I'm glad I'm here. And if I say anything that you don't agree with, let's just leave it at that. It's not about anything other than whatever comes out, comes out. And I'm going to start with some poems. This first poem I call The Magic Valley. Earth DNA poles genetic memory, ancient spirit, sky, father sky, the magic valley, earth, mother earth, childhood distances, hard to remember what was never to be forgotten, never to be forgotten, predators stalk all living things, the death mask, feeds on living essence. Feelings become fugitives, emotions, cold alibis. When hurt, can't hurt anymore, raged ones rise, feeding the beast. All aggression is justified and the beast grows. Flow of thought, harnessed into mindsets, a damning, Diseased spirits, cannibals and vampires feast, mining minds in civilized ritual. The religion of business and machine pay homage to technologic gods. At material altars, the mass prays a prayer of need and wanting more. Earth DNA pulls genetic memory, ancient spirit, sky, father sky, the magic valley, earth, mother earth. 
what was never to be forgotten. Children of earth, what we see affects our realities. What is always to be remembered, the beast needs us to believe. Always to be remembered, free our minds, free the reality. We drank from your well, still we're thirsty. We tasted your promises, still we're hungry. We saw your splendor, still it's beyond us. We tried your love ways, still we're confused. We felt your politic, still we're feeling it. We worked your jobs, still we're poor. We die in your wars, still you make more war. We obeyed your laws, still we're not safe. We gave you a chance, still you don't trust us. We wanted to get along, still we're wanting. We heard what you say, still you're talking. We drank from your well, still we're thirsty. Mind-breaking is rule-makers' ruling game. Mind-fixers and mind-takers are the same, creating the laws of supply and demand, deliberate as cutting knife in a steady hand, trying to sleep off another deep sleep, but the howling dog knows no mercy having to face this industrial storm. Nightmares are memories that weep. Intimate moments are new world crimes, fugitives in the land of dropping dimes. Authority means what it means, thought chains for minds of dreams. A man with beaded eyes saw as surreal difference what we are and what we feel. Distances from here to what we can't see is waste wasting life's spirit as energy. Language of genocide, progress for profit. Industrial forked tongues needing to feed. Techno religions mainline their techno habit. Prayers to techno gods, a fix is greed's greed. Madman quotes madman, justifying more madmen. The only alternative, devoured by no choice. Memories of the forgotten, remembering again. Deathly silence, when silence loses its voice. Empire builders plant with fear that breeds. Possessed love and hate from distorted seeds. The living owned, freedom is desire to own. Living is life, trying to feel less alone. Been hanging out down south of hell, playing to the music of a broken bell. Hard times and beating myself up inside my head. I was the walking wounded or the living dead. Tie a yellow ribbon around my brain. My mind booked, it's been gone so long. Rash traveling with mad and insane. Tears fell like tears. Rain fell like rain. Shadow man called, catch me if you can knowing he can't be caught. He's the shadow man. Trickster turned free into junk and a rubber room. And junkie fix has even stolen from the moon. Leaders know they can't trust ones who follow. Followers know not to trust ones who lead. Love, hate, despair, and promises turn narcotic. If everything's normal, then reality's psychotic. 
claiming to understand dimension and space. Babylon huffs and puffs, bullying around in the natural order. Temptation rules in the valley of fools. Celestial cannibals feast on essence. The civilized hide out from their lives. The traumatized worry about everything, hypnotized into nothing at all been hanging out down south of hell, playing to the music of a broken bell, hard times and beating myself up inside my head. I was the walking wounded or the living dead. See, just so that we have an understanding. See, to me, it's. I, I come from the tribes. I remember I had that much of my identity. And um, when I look at what's happening here in the Western Hemisphere, I can't forget that tribal memory. I may not know the language, I may not know many things, but I know. But I do know many things also. But what I remember with my genetic memory, which is a basis of many of my realities, is that the way that people need to live with this hemisphere, with the earth in reality, but with this hemisphere, is the people need to live with the earth not on it, not from it, with it. See, it's not about, so that to me, democracy is the enemy of the tribes. To me, technologic industrial civilization is the enemy of the tribes. It is the enemy of the natural world, to me. Now it's like the, the concept of male dominating gods, to me, is the enemy of the natural world. And with democracy, we'll start with this. And before there was a democracy, or before there was even the concept of democracy, the tribes were the majority of the people on this hemisphere. Then came the democracy. And now there is a democracy, and the tribes are the smallest numerical minority. See, so I have a problem with that. It's an, it makes the whole abstraction that people keep hurtling about democracy, it makes it a very ugly lie to me. The, the reasoning and the excuses that are made that will know that's not the way democracy is supposed to work. I don't accept that. To me, democracy does exactly what it was created and designed to do. It was created and designed to protect and perpetuate the interest of the ruling class land owner. Now, if America is the seat of democracy, well, understand this. If you are a white male, you didn't get to vote or have any say in the concept because you had no value if you didn't own land. If you were a woman, you were considered to be inferior, so therefore you had no say because your intelligence was not respected. If you were black, you were property, so therefore you had no say. And if you were from the tribes, an Indian, you were not, not a, you were the majority, so therefore you were the enemy. Because the idea of majority rule obviously couldn't work <laughs> with their perception. Now, see, I bring this up, now not to confuse it. 
communism, capitalism, socialism, <laughs> Nazism, they're all, to me, different, different ways of painting the face of the predator. They're different masks that this small industrial ruling class, that this ethnic rich, these are the ways they paint the mask on so that everyone thinks it's a little bit different. But the net result of this is that there are a the ethnic ruling class, the industrial rich, a small minority of people that profit from all of this. See, and now for me as a tribe, see, I don't want to get into your political messes and concepts, but see, it threatens our survival and our life. If the American people don't start to get it pretty soon about what is going on, that's an immediate threat to us. See, now we have survived to this point because we've had the enemy and we've had the sympathizers and somehow that's kind of just, it's kept us alive and it's in some bizarre abstract way. But now they're talking about new world order <laughs> and they're talking about many, many things. See, so for us as tribes, it's in our best interest that it somehow the citizens of America start to understand what is happening. But there seems to be a problem in getting the citizens to really think about it because, see, it's un-American. It's, it's, it's like almost planted in the mind. It's negative to question democracy. See, so ev nobody even wants to think it. See, so every decision that you make to correct the problem, you keep it in this abstraction that has no respect for any of you's voice. Because it is what it is, and what it was created is what it is. It was created to protect the interest of the ruling class property owner. Now we are being faced with serious things. The way that they have the way that they have discovered of murdering the air and the water and attacking the earth and this with this new this new deadliness that they have created, these new concepts and forms of death that have been created. See, and we have to come face to that. See, like to understand, like in Europe, see, they had what the plagues. And they had these times during the Dark Ages in Europe when all this death because of the uncleanliness, the human uncleanliness ravaged Europe at some point in the Dark Ages. See, well now there's a technological uncleanliness. And it's ravaging the environment that the people need to live. See, so literally our act has to be cleaned up. See, so somewhere in here, we need to at least not be afraid to think and consider the realities of what are going on. Because DNA, descendant and ancestor, descendant and ancestor. So we are the descendants, but we are also the ancestors. So somewhere in here, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to take care of our descendants the ones we are the ancestors to. We have a responsibility to do that. Moths and other sacred wings, butterflies and bees whisper in breath of the wind, blessed ways blessing away things. Dreams are the mind's streams, thought pictures of the spirit. There are dreams of the day. There are dreams of the night. Thinking and dreaming are related. Dreams of the day we make our own. Dreams of night are part of eternal stone. There are dream takers taking from dream worlds, taking dreams as a way of stealing thoughts, turning minds inside and out, Dream slavers want to change our connections to ourselves. Mess with our dreams, make us unsure. Unclear about right and wrong. Feed our dreams and instincts to industrial profit machine. 
difference between dream and fantasy, reality and illusion, center and no center. Dreams of the day keep our spirit alive, our creative mind, who we really are. With dreams we can create and heal, follow our original purpose. Dreams are protection, good medicine, blessed ways, blessing way things. Sun and moon continue. We are all on one journey. Sister in a life like a kitten in a cage, woman in a trap, showing in her eyes escape plan, waiting for an opening. Time is running by. Pretty soon could be too late. Like a kitten in a cage, vanishing happiness fantasy, peaceful coexistence on someone else's terms, resistance fronting surface smiles, growing weaker, growing stronger, determination wills holding out, pain in a soft face, like a kitten in a cage, who wants to be her master? She's not anybody's pet. Looking out for lines, fearful men's breaking dreams, jagged edges falling around her, sister in a life, woman in a trap. Spoken anger, silent hurt, some kind of wheel going around and around inside her head inside her heart, heated passions chilling effects. When they first met, she couldn't forget. Time's only purpose was for them together. They talked together and were gentle. They laid together and were flame. She told him her dreams, trusting him with her prayers. She needed a friend. She needed a man. As newness stretches thin, turns out he didn't understand. Part of the man let her down. Part of the man couldn't give. Part of the man he never was. Part of the man, part of her life. Been all through this before. Heated passions, chilling effects. And here she is acting tough again. Turning herself off fast. Curtains dropping in place, giving away nothing in her eyes. Our relationship to the earth. <coughs> in the reality of power, the reality of power, not, not the illusion of authority. See, authority, see, we've been programmed with this great illusion that authority is power, but it's not. See, authority is something else. Power is something else. Power, real power, is in our relationship to the earth and the universe. Real power is in relationship with us to ourselves, human being, human physical being, spirit. Real power is in the relationship of the human to the being, to the earth. Now that's what real power is. Everything else is an illusion of real power. And it only becomes power when we step into the illusion and no longer understand the reality, then, then in some reverse way. Now, our relationship to the earth, See, our whole relationship to the earth changed with the concept of the male dominating God. Because the male dominating God, the notion of the male dominant God, is that all spiritual or religious, spiritual value was converted to religious value and placed above the earth. Above the earth changing the relationship of all of the people to viewing the earth as the mother entity. It changed that perception to one of a, of a male removed from the earth. 
See, and after that change came, then it became all right to attack the earth. And the attitude became from protecting the earth to exploiting the earth. Now what we have in common, DNA, DNA, we all have the DNA of the earth. We are made up, flesh and blood is of the materials of the earth. So we all have that. That's who we are. We are a part of the earth. We are earth and water. That's what we are. So obviously, in real terms of real power, our connection is into protecting that because that's what we are a part of. But the male dominating God theory, well, see, at one time, our DNA all comes from the earth. Within what I call our genetic memory, all right, is the information that goes all the way back to our beginning. We are the ancestors and the descendants. See, what we all, every one of us in this room have in common is that at some point in the history of our people, we were all tribes. Every one of us are descendants from tribes. And every one of us, the way what are called the Indians, the tribes of the Western Hemisphere, the way the tribes of the Western Hemisphere resisted. It wasn't just whites. It was this whole world view of this technologic civilization. But anyway, the way that the tribes resisted within the more recent history was the same way your ancestors resisted in the ancient history. Nobody took the male dominating God thing willingly. Now this is, has to do, and this has to do everything, this has everything in the world to do with sexism. See, because in or prior to that, there really wasn't this, this whole notion of sexism when we were the tribes. See, sexism came with, with the, 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 the establishment of the concept of a male god. And see, and then what had, but, see, but with the tribes, everybody understood the value of male, female in the natural, real world. So there's this tremendous amount of respect and, because people understood the balance of power. So the woman had to be attacked. Because she represented the earth. She represented too much in the minds of the people. See, so, that, so this, what that we will call revisionism. See, I mean, it's like, see, for the tribes of Europe, they related to the earth as the mother, the earth as the mother, but in terminology as the goddess and the serpent. See, and the serpent represented, was close to the earth, represented the goddess. See, they knew they couldn't erase that from the minds of the people. So what they did was they created Adam and Eve <laughs> and the Garden of Eden. And therefore, then the, so then the woman and the serpent are teamed up. But see, but it, create, it brought sin. <laughs> now, this was deliberately done. And I say this because it's as factual as I can understand it to be. See, and it's, but anyway, for us, it's in our best interest to understand the realities that we have to deal with. Because at some point, we have to face our responsibility about the DNA, about our role in the continuation and the evolution. See, and the way that, to me, it's obviously going is that there probably in the end is no political solution or no economic solution or no military solution. There is no existing solution. We have to create it. See, more than save the democracy, more than save the male dominating God concepts, which basically have to do with obedience and subservience, male, more than to saving these dominating, feeding, predatory concepts, at some point, we're going to have to make a decision, are we going to protect this earth or are we going to protect these things that have been designed to feed off of us? Designed to feed off of us. Predatory energy. Predatory energy. The same way that can take and, and mine the resources of the earth and turn it into a fuel to run the machine electrical world that we're becoming more and more a part of. There's a way that they have created to mine the spirit human being, human physical being, spirit, to mind the being through the human. 
to feed off of our spirit and our essence. See, because then when you're feeding off of that, there's no way there can be any balance or any clarity. And then we, we need an ex excess. We need these other things that the other energy system is creating. And just as we see in the other energy system, that, I mean, the things that mine to make the resources, what we look at, the world, the electric neon world we're in now. Well, we see the results, the pollution. We see we, more, people become more and more environmentally aware. Right? And see the pollution and the poisoning of what's happening. Right? The internal mining process, the mining of the being through the human. Well, every insecurity and fear and paranoia that you have, all right, don't want to face every self-doubt is the pollution left over from the mining of our essence, our spirit. Because it's in the best interest of the predator that we, number one, we don't see clearly. Because it's all about perception. It's a diseased spirit. Columbus was a diseased spirit. He was, I mean, <laughs> human form and all that, but he was a diseased spirit, and everybody that came with him was carrying the same disease. It was like, it's a disease of possession. It's like somebody possessed them. Civilization possessed them. So therefore, they were driven mad by possession, and they had to possess, and they changed everything to possess, to the whole, from the perception of possession. Love came from possession. It turned into possession. Hate turned into possession. Joy, everything turned into possession. And therefore, nothing was free again. And it drove the people mad, see, but because everybody was obedient and, and going along with the established new terminology and things, see, it was called normal. But the behavior, you look at the history of the behavior, the behavior was very, very aggressive. Very, based, the history of, of, of Western civilization is based upon intense, intense amounts of blood sacrifice. They sacrificed your ancestors, the tribes in order to get you to accept what you accept today. They terrorized psychological warfare and brutal warfare until the people accepted. When Columbus came here, it was during the time of the Inquisition. Europe was in, 400, was in the 400th year of approximately a 500, what they define as a 500 year period of Inquisition. And the Inquisition was all about, because, was that five, 500 years, 900 years ago, your ancestors, the European, your European ancestors were still praying the old ways. They were still following the spirits. They were still, they were still, still relating to the old ways. So the Inquisition became the means and the vehicle of establishing the authority of the church over the people on the land, turning the church into basically God on earth. And in order to get the people to accept that whole concept, they had the Inquisition. And the Inquisition was, Basically, if you challenge that concept, you were guilty of heresy. And if you were accused of it, you were guilty. See, and it, so like, if I accuse you of heresy, then you got to go in front of the board. <laughs> and he says, you're all guilty. And it's mandatory that we have to torture you. We have to do it. It was mandatory that the church... Anybody accused had to be tortured, and they were automatically guilty. They were automatically guilty and had to be tortured and then killed. And anybody that was guilty, then the church got to take all their property. 500 years, 500 years, approximately this went on. So by the time Columbus got here in the 400th year of, year of it, see, they were all insane. They had been driven mad. Did you ever get the blues? Well, the sky fell down and you fell through the hole in your soul, finding yourself looking for something you lost and you don't know what it is. Days and nights are months and years with those can't lose the blues, blues, dragging you in and out of the looking glass. The land of desperate hearts, tearing at your mind. Did you ever get the blues? Did they ever get you? Where the sky fell down, pulling all the stars on you, leaving only darkness. The world you no longer understood, 
seeing the eyes of people around you, finding they didn't see it. So where does that leave you? Breaking the looking glass, forgetting which world you're in, surrounded in the density of slowing light, watching flames turn into embers, knowing that's the promise of your life. Isolation, kindling separated from the spark. Did you ever get the blues? Did you ever say it? And no one could hear you. I saw Columbus the other day. He's a wino on 6th and Main, every day blotting out something he can't quite remember. I saw Henry VIII crying in the eyes of a battered woman, hiding from a violence she didn't know how she got herself into this. I saw Caesar in a foot soldier, needing a job, waiting for his bullet. Patriotic fever, not understanding war, just following orders. I saw pharaohs, princes, and queens in a haze unlike a dream. Industrial peasants all in a row. Why aren't their lives their own? I saw a Nazi and a worn out lie, nourishing prophets with blood and spirit. National security, the needle we are injected through. I saw a chance today. Reality connected to our shadow. How we live clears it all up. When we learn, we stop paying. There was a crazy lady shouting from the sidelines, you can't take it with you, so why take it now? It's all one big insane mistake being made. Wage slaves must escape this lifeless cycle. Rage master spews his meaningless meaningless promises, acidic lies blinding to the mind's eye, surrendering living to submissions get by, look at yourself in dismal pretense, pretending freedom, as though that's a defense. There was a crazy lady shouting from the sidelines, there are no secrets here, only shames and disgraces, Pavlov's rat snicker, at what you don't recognize. You only see what the mirror wants you to see. Craving upward mobility means someone's tied down. Weird bondage trips in straight-laced fashion. Business as usual keeps cracking its profit whip. In marketplaces of products, you're the main product. Obedience pays, but it doesn't pay enough to break even. Not much of a trade, getting ahead for losing your mind. There was a crazy lady shouting from the sidelines. Babylon is doing again what it's always done before, fronting its dark side with more new pretty plastic, telling you the ticket to heaven is do what they say. Don't look at their hands if you can't handle blood. Don't look for their heart if you can't stand the cold. Each lie you embrace means you blind yourself to a truth, burdening yourself, picking up, carrying Babylon's deceit, paradox, living without vision, dying to see the light while the sun's on fire and we're part of the sun. Cries of the flesh, Soul gets no rest. Heart feels all alone. Thoughts break like brittle stone. In desperation, I may have been the most desperate one. In a smile or flash of an eye, I fooled myself too many times. Trickster has way of turning tables. Dreams can fade into distant fables. Knee can change men into fools. I know I played by those rules. Smiled until I cried. Sold myself to common lies. They sounded good at the time. Nothing is more, more or less. All that time talking to the wall. Started in a run, slowed to a stall. 
There was some beauty I can't forget, romancing stars I couldn't touch. They wish in my empty hands. Wishes don't count for much. Living in a fantasy of this world, reality drops into my hands. What won't be said, what won't be thought. I was lost in the palace of fears, every room decorated with hidden tears. Reflection danced behind broken mirrors, changing partners, every partner was me, hanging to a past like it was my last breath. Time of lifetimes became uncompromising truths, lines drawn in the dust where there was no dust. In illusions of man, predator won't calm down. Is it protect myself from love or is it protect love from me? A woman with a tattooed purple butterfly flying high on her inside thigh cast a smile and sauntered on over. A throaty whisper, hey stranger, want to fly with me and my butterfly. I can tell in your eyes a reason to escape. The path to glory has been changed into a concrete story. On the way to the mystery chamber, you have to see the other side. Dreams are paths that must be followed. It's love until it isn't love. Doesn't matter who you're dancing with. Hideouts and sanctuaries aren't the same face. Whoever does, whatever they do, you make your own lines, your creator and destroyer all in one. It's love until it isn't love. A thing lasts as long as it lasts. We are the companions we chose. We are the situations we choose. On the way to the mystery chamber, the adventure is in our flying wings. It's love until it isn't love. A woman with a tattooed purple butterfly flew with me, then set me free. Now about responsibility. <laughs> Madness. <laughs> Now, about religion now, see, to me, <laughs> there's a difference between religion and spirit. See, I mean, I personally think that religion is a way of feeding upon spirit. See, because Spirit, we have a spiritual responsibility to life and the universe. See, spirit and responsibility are like one thought. We have a spiritual responsibility. But these dominator religions, they don't teach us about spiritual responsibility. They teach us about guilt, sin, and blame. The trinity of the chain. See, but that whole concept of guilt, sin, and blame is not about responsibility. It's about not taking responsibility. It's about blame. It's about shifting responsibility. See, but once we get the concept of guilt, sin, and blame, and once, it, once we get it that it applies to us, <laughs> just for being here. <laughs> and when they were creating sexism, see, there were these monks or whoever they are, the ones that questions I will bring about the Bible, right? Is I don't trust the interpreters, right? Uh, they were all men, they never took baths and they never saw a woman. <laughs> <laughs> So that tells you something about the coverage you're going to get, right? <laughs> and that's a historical, factual reality now, right? I mean, I'm not being blasphemous or sacrilegious.
I didn't create it, I'm only a victim of it. <laughs> but about our responsibility, see, so uh, see, we are attacked in such a way, the mining process. The whole concept of guilt. See, the reality is we enter into this world and we will leave this world. That's the way that it works. But in the technologic male dominator God civilization, it's called birth and death, and it's given a different meaning. And through religious definition, it is basically saying that everybody's guilty for being born. It's the number one crime is just being human. Oh, yeah, I remember. But anyway, there was a train of thought going on that the, the, our sin had to do with because we came out of a woman's body. See, there were people that influenced the religions you believe in that thought like that. It was the sin, which I find interesting. Uh, but once it sinks into the mind about the industrial concept of death, See, because it's not about spirit. See, I mean, you look at it. If you are a good religious person and you obey the way and accept all of the injustice and all of the aggression and accept all of the wrong and the lie and the deceit and the doubles, you know, the double speak and the illusion and everything, and accept all of those things, then you will go to heaven. And in heaven, you will meet a male God sitting on a mate on a Physical throne, streets of gold, pearly gates, all material. What about the spirit? <laughs> and if you, but if you don't obey, then you go to hell. See down there, it's a man with a tail and a pitchfork <laughs> and fire. All physical world concept, material world concept. Nothing about the spirit. So they plant those concepts and then tell us when we enter into this reality that we're guilty for being here. <laughs> See, so they already tell us we're on the road to hell. And only by being subservient to their brutality and aggression and hypocrisy can we redeem ourselves. Now that's the practical reality of religion. And I, I, I do not mean to offend anyone. Right, but the reality is maybe we should be offended by that practical reality, you know. And now the guilt part. We enter into this reality, and when we enter into this reality as human beings, our life becomes a continuum of experiences. We have one experience after another. And the, the reason of that, part of the reasoning of that is we are to learn from those experiences to help us deal with the next experiences. So whatever experience we encounter, we are not to judge ourselves by it. We are not to condemn ourselves by the negative experiences. We just got to figure out well, I've had these experiences now, so we need to figure out how to keep from having those experiences as we enter on into our journey. See, learn, learn from what has happened to us. But we're not supposed to take it as little balls and chains all right, and weigh ourselves down with it. Now, when we were all in our tribal common ancestry, Let's go back 10,000 years and we're all tribes. See, when we were all tribes, then we had our communities and it was, living, it was to live in harmony and respect with the universe. So everybody in the community taught us the lessons we needed to know. And we, we knew our purpose. We knew what we were doing. We knew everything was good for us. So we didn't make as many mistakes. And there was no guilt, sin, and blame. It was about spiritual, about responsibility as a human being. Now that's, we have that in a common past. See, then it got changed into, see, so anyway, and then the other thing I want to add in is before I forget is like about the respectability of advertising. 
the acceptability and respectability of advertising is so normal. But every advertisement basically is an attack against our essence and our spirit because every advertisement is basically telling us that our value will increase by what we consume. Now, you know, talk about, you know, yeah, right, they can't, they can't put subliminals on the movie screen, right? Don't buy popcorn, buy popcorn, buy popcorn. They can't put that on, right? While they subliminally attack us every waking hour we have, it's almost like genocide, spiritual genocide, genocide against the spirit. See, and I kind of think it's working. The reason I kind of think it's working is because, see, America right now looks like Jonestown to me in a very suicidal frame of mind. Because the American citizens, they, they don't listen to the teachings of their ancient ones. They don't listen to the teachings of their past. They listen to, they listen to, to industrial ruling class exploiters. So I see while they have no spiritual affinity, they don't feel spiritually connected to their past. And the way they listen to their industrial exploiters, it shows me the condition that the earth is being turned into that they have no spiritual relationship to their descendants. It's like whatever this thing is, it's eating up the spirit of the people. See, so now the tribes, all the hell we raise and all we get involved to is we don't want that to happen to us. That's what our trip is. We want that to happen to us because we see it. And we know that that's not living. We know that somewhere somebody's trading living for existing and surviving, and that's not living. And we must not trick, allow them to trick us into believing or thinking that it is. To survive is to survive. To exist is to exist, and to live is something else. But we're programmed to not like ourselves enough or trust ourselves enough to truly do anything. We're programmed. See, that's what all the doubts and insecurities and all the things that get, all that pollution, it ends up in our thought process because of the negative way this predatory system feeds upon us. See, well then obviously it reaches a point, the further we become separated from our spiritual reality or our reality to the earth, then the more powerless people start to feel. I live in a society as an oppressed person, and I, I understand and recognize that I'm an oppressed person, but I don't feel powerless. And I turn around and look at the citizens of America, they don't feel oppressed, they feel powerless. And it makes me have to question, because they're allegedly the best educated people in the world. How come they feel powerless? They allegedly have the most, you know, the highest economy in the world. How come they feel powerless? You ever feel like something's missing from your life? That's what they're sucking out of you. It's the energy that's being taken out. See, so it's the problems that we're confronted with, there, it's like, see, we need to find a cure for this disease. This predatory disease that lives in the spirit, the mind, this disease, it's a, it's a, the, the, this, we have to find a cure for this disease that affects our perceptions. There is no, like I said, you know, it's not like about, it's not, it's not about revolution. Because to me, every revolutionary loses. <laughs> because they got to be badder than the bad to get, to get it and change it. And, you know, and it's like once you pick it up, <laughs> hard to put it down. You know, it's kind of how that one works. It's about evolution. See, and number one, we're here at the right time. Right? We're here at the right time. Number two, time is on our side. It's just a matter of whether we are on time's side. Okay? Um, and what it's going to take is for us to, number one, accept ourselves for who we are. See, I have no identity crisis. My DNA is of this earth. I know who I am. And there's nothing anybody going to ever say to change <laughs> my recognition. I know where I come from. 
I'm good and bad and a whole mix of a whole lot of things, but that's me. I accept that. And it doesn't make me invalid. It doesn't mean that whatever I have to contribute is, has no value. That, that is, see, that is us. That is our story. We are human beings. We live in a different time when we don't have our ancestors. We don't have the community to teach us the lessons. So within this life, we make harder mistakes because it's a harder world. But in the nature of evolution, there's a reason to all of this. And if we would just get it, within a two or three generation period of time, we could change everything if we would use our minds to create those solutions. First, we have to accept ourselves. We're not guilty. We're responsible for whatever we do, but that's not guilt. And whatever we do, if we can't live with it and we can't handle it, then don't do it. It's that simple. And if we used to do it and don't like, if we used to like it, if we used to do it and like it, but now we realize we shouldn't have done it, well, enjoy that you liked it. <laughs> take anything away from our essence. It's a part of the experience. And we go on. We should never lie to ourselves. Never we, we should never lie to ourselves about what we're up to, even if we don't like it. <laughs> even if it means it's a hard face to look at. <laughs> you know, we shouldn't lie to ourselves. We should establish our own basis of reality. And the only way we can establish our own basis of reality is to tell ourselves the truth. Because we will start to become more coherent. See, we should sort out these, the, the lies of self-rationalization and self-justification. We should know what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it will influence and affect our behavior. Because we start to see more clearly. And understanding, it's like, you know, like uh, how many times, a lot of situations where someone will say, I mean, somebody's going to start out to do something, and then there's a bad result, and they say, well, that wasn't my intention, living the life we never intended. And it made me think about that, because a lot of times we'd run into this, where I know people are trying to do something good. But the result wouldn't be what they intended. So then kind of come to understand one day that it's kind of like our ages and our seasons. You know, the four seasons, the four ages, birth is infant is identity, <laughs> you know. Uh, and youth is, is like learning. And the adult is like knowledge. And maybe if we get old, it's like wisdom. They run parallel to the the four. By the way, there's motive, intent, understanding, and action. And a lot of problems that we have in this world is always our intentions will be good, but we never question our motives. <laughs> and so I mean about being honest with ourselves. If our motives are in synchronicity with our intentions, then our understanding will be in synchronicity, and therefore our action will be. So we should never lie to ourselves about what we're up to. It will help us. It will help us, <laughs> you know, because we're re we're making our definitions. We're see because our definitions of reality are very necessary. We are born, enter into this reality with the abilities to make those definitions. The existing definitions are just ways of mining our spirit. You know, they tell us whoever's got the biggest gun is, is powerful, but that's about violence. It's not about power. They tell us whoever controls the most money is powerful, but that's, about, but that's about greed. That's not about power. But if we believe those things are power, then what does that say about us? We're giving it. See, that's how we feed it. That's how it drinks our essence. through our beliefs. I tried to believe, but I had a problem with it because there's a lie in the middle. B E L I E V E. So either we know or we don't. <laughs> you know, kind of how it works. But our instincts and our intuitions are a part of knowing. And if we would trust ourselves and accept ourselves, 
We have it all. We have all this information. Found in the street of images, next door to the school of hard knocks and promise more promises, there's this political social disease, got the people living on their knees, playing stand-up behind the mask of pride. Sorry, you lose and nobody wins. Submission makes every man a bride. In the madhouse of fantasies, there was democracy down on her back. Big business and feds crawling all over her, crooning you might as well enjoy it, while the civilized passed by with closed eyes. The cross and its shadow, the double cross. Obedience is heaven. All else leads to hell. Do the work, pay the tax, don't trust yourself. Shoot up all the material you can get, then try to get your hands on more. Let the crooked dealer keep the score. Lead your mind into guilt, sin, and regret. The stage is set. Puppeteer, strings, and puppet. Found in the street of images, there are dreams trying to breathe, life and assistance to the mind. What we believe is what we create. Predators don't tell the truth. To them, hate is love. Love is hate. There are dreams trying to get in, bring back together destiny and our fate. There are dreams waiting to fulfill the mind, starve predator, and leave the scene behind. Okay, I'm going to close here in a minute. And whatever I left hanging, then try to figure it out. Right? <laughs> Sometimes it's just that way. America drove me crazy. It's not a joke. <laughs> but it's all right. Because I looked at the scene and I thought, wow. Because <laughs> all this is acceptable to them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, all the sane and the normal, they voted for Bill and Hillary and Al. <laughs> I, got, I can't let them slide. You know, See, Bill Clinton is just another one of those faint painted masks. His job is to put his job is to get us to accept what we wouldn't have accepted with George. <laughs> because when George puked in the emperor's lap, that was it. <laughs> I'm serious. That was it for George. Made the good old boys club look. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously bad. So we got Bill. <laughs> because Bill believes in Bill. <laughs> and he don't believe in nothing else. Bill believes in Bill. He, he's an interesting paradox. Wouldn't go to wouldn't go to Vietnam because he didn't want to he didn't believe in war and didn't want to kill women and children. But it's all right down in Waco. <laughs> to do it. And those people in Waco, these people were executed on the basis of an accusation. It's very important. Maybe the mo one of the most important things in Bill Clinton's whole trip. See, because the lies about national health and the lie, all the other lies that he's telling and he's programmed to put into us are lies, all right? I mean, we will see if I'm nuts or not about this, but but this thing down here was like direct action. And these people were accused of a crime. Very important to remember that, you know what, how many people were killed? 80, 90 people. On the basis of an accusation, and America accepted it like it was watching cops. <laughs> like it was a TV show. See, and it's a very serious sign to me a very serious sign about the ruthlessness of the state. I find it very interesting that Bill, seeing the danger of Bill, that 
is that he's one of, he comes from our generation and everybody's so desperate to believe. Everybody's so desperate to shoot up the fix of a promise that they accept Bill. But Bill's problem, you know, was when he said he didn't inhale, see, that should have been, everyone should have understood. I mean, really, in, in every sense of the word. <laughs> I know people who never did stop inhaling. And I trust them much more than I trust him. <laughs> but he said, see, but it was the lie everybody wanted to hear. See, for our generation, it was a cute lie. We accept it. But the deal is, it opened the door for a whole lot of lies. Now, NAFTA. Let's look at NAFTA. We're watching, well, we're watching Hillary physically turn plastic <laughs> every day, every month that this administration is in office. You look at the pictures of Hillary as the governor's wife. Look at the pictures of Hillary on Vanity Magazine or whatever. Physically, there's a physical transformation taking place here. I'm very concerned about that. <laughs> she needs a health care program. <laughs> so she wouldn't be doing that shit. <laughs> see, I want to say this because, see, I know how desperate everyone is. See, and the women are being drawn into this political system. And the women are, and so to, to the women, it's a big victory, every woman that gets in there. You know, and I'm not, to me, I don't, political systems, you know, I, to me, I don't think that they plug in when you vote for president. I don't think the computer's plugged in. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that's a lot of trust to give to one person who, who programs the computers that count the votes. I mean, that's a lot of trust. So anything can be decided and go many ways. So I, I mean, my own personal opinion is that the presidents aren't picked by the people anymore. It's all guerrilla theater, all right? And the decision is made way before and all the rest is just theater so that it hypes everybody up and gives them an adrenaline boost and new shot of hope, right? And then back down to the same old thing. But NAFTA, now if my understanding of NAFTA is correct, you know, it's, See, as a net result of all these things that are going on, they're going to create what is called an, something to the effect of an economic policy board council that will set economic policy. See, now the economic policies that are set by this group of people, once this board is set into place, their economic decisions supersede all existing federal, state, or local or community laws. And, and, and if, if some country sues because of unfair trade, you have a higher standard that you have, or environmental standards, some country sues that it's unfair, unfair trade to them, then they have to change the environmental standard. <laughs> now you think about that when you think about spotted owls and trees and you think about the rivers and the lakes and you think about all of the things that you've been working so hard to get to protect the environment, Excuse my language, but these fucks just went in there and completely took it away from you. And who did it? L. He beat up on Ross Perot in a debate. <laughs> L, the environmental president. See, now you're not going to get to see this next year. You're not going to get to see it next month. But trust me, your children will understand it very well. New World Order. New world order. Bill Clinton is a part of it. See, and I bring this out because we should not be blindly led because we need to believe. We should never lie to ourselves. So when we see whatever is going on, we shouldn't lie to ourselves about it, even if we can do no more at the time than tell ourselves the truth about it. But we should call it for what it is. Because otherwise, you know, watch out for the Pied Piper. See, in our generation, our generation, we've always been a threat. See, the way that it works, see, I watched, I've seen so many, the way that it works. If you have a generation or a group of people that are a threat, 
then you find the one that you can work the most reasonably with and you empower him. They call it puppet governments and shit. So we have a generation that has always been a threat. The baby boom generation rebelled against the system as it was. And the reason the baby boom generation rebelled had to do with economics. America was the most affluent society that ever, had ever been created when the baby boom generation was young. And as a result of this created affluency, the young people rebelled against the existing dark ages, the old world order. It terrified the old world order. Because this, this generation, hey, these are the slave workers for the next 30 years. We need them to obey. We need them to feed our economy in our whole way. So, but it was based upon affluency. So they set into effect a redistribution of the wealth. The redistribution of the wealth took place in the form, the first step of it took place in the form of an energy crisis which took in the 70s. See, so the price of oil went up. And all good Americans said, well, it's the, the Arabs. We'll blame the Arabs. We accept that reasoning. It's the Arabs. See? And then along with the price of the oil, so that meant the price of everything went up. Everything. Because this baby boom generation is maturing. They're getting families. They're getting these responsibilities. So it tightened the economic noose. Because the other danger of this baby boom generation is that at some point, through maturing and the natural process, they're going to be the only ones alive. <laughs> and all our other ones will be gone. So in order to make sure that their rules still stand, they had another redistribution of the wealth to take care of the 80s. We call it uh, excessive pen Pentagon military spending and savings and loans. But that was an act of treason. It was a political act with a criminal face painting. But it was an act of treason. Anyway, so these billions and billions of dollars are robbed through these, gener through these two decades. So that by the time the baby boom generation can assume what is defined as political power, economic power has been removed about 10 generations. And welcome to the neon fiefdom. So, and Bill, see, Bill doesn't get it. <laughs> he truly doesn't. I mean, Bill and Hillary are busy playing the cleavers. Which, see, and that, that world excludes the majority of the world when you play the cleavers. It's all Ward, June, Beeve, and Wally. <laughs> and Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Takes care of it. It's got nothing to do with our realities. See, so for us, in our responsibilities, we have the ability and we must take responsibility to do the best that we can with the best that we got. And understand that we're in the right time and in the right place. And if we will allow ourselves to use our minds as clearly and coherently as we possibly can, we will affect the change that must come. We are a part of evolution. All right? And that's the way that it is. Now, the way that the way that this society, this this murderous society, because I'm gonna I'm gonna use these kind of words, because to me, when you when you poison the life support environments, the air and the water, and you make it so that it's unfit to use, and you can no longer use it, then that to me is murder. So we make the decision ourselves how we're going to deal with it. But first, we have to trust ourselves enough to use our minds as clearly and coherently as we can. And all the rest of it will fall into place. It will all fall into place. The earth is a living entity. Earth is not death. Earth is life. If the earth was death, then we would have no life. So earth is a living entity. And if we would just allow ourselves to open up in however way we figure out to do it, we can tap into that. The consciousness. It's a matter of whether we're willing to accept that reality. But you watch. If you notice, historically, people feel that people reach a state of powerlessness when they no longer have a relationship to the land. 
See, and for us, we have to make decisions now. Are we going to be good human beings or are we going to be good citizens? And it's, we can't be both. You know, I didn't create those rules. I didn't make them up. But the reality is they are there. And if we do not lie to ourselves, if we will tell ourselves the truth, then we will understand we can't be both. Because the rules of civilization don't allow it. They prevent it. Because the way their laws are applied, we cannot do both. So we will see if our genetic memories activate. We will see if we remember that we come from a people, no matter who we are, that are older than this civilization. And it's how, and about the thing is, what we need to me, what we need to evolve towards is understanding that to way, the way to live with the earth is in the tribal, with a tribal perception. To live in harmony with the earth and keep the harmony the best that we can. We can evolve to that situation. We can make the technology and all of these things change to that situation. Now, but the situation has to change. All right, it's going to change. Now, what, if we just allow it to eat our spirit and erase our brains and our thought process, then the change will come, the earth will change, and we don't get to have this anymore. Or the opportunity is we are now the antibiotic to this disease that's infesting the world. See, the world has now created an antibiotic, our generation. So if we will use our minds, then we can influence the change. But any way you cut it, it can't stay as it is. Okay, I'm going to close with a poem called uh, One of the Colors. And I thank you for, uh, the time gets long, and I thank you for putting up with the long time. <laughs> Happiness is how we feel about ourselves. The good we think, the good we feel, the good we do. We are part of the dream time. Happiness is one of the colors. There are shadow casters who trick us about happiness. We are taught to wish for things to make us happy. We are not taught to dream for happiness itself. We can't buy happiness. We can't sell it. We can't steal it. We can't borrow it. And we can't capture it. But we can create it. Love can't bring us happiness, but happiness can bring us to love. Power can't bring us happiness, but happiness can show us power. On the line of what is real and what really isn't, dream for happiness. Somewhere between heart and mind, the spirit of life can be seen. Happiness comes in a way to dream, and I thank you for your time. <laughs> drummers and singers closed it down. We were talking about living history. I know you guys remember Wounded Knee, 1973, you know? Well, a guy I'm going to introduce you to, I mean, I want you to know because we're introducing Steve Robidoux, you know, and he's going to tell you about what they got planned for Leonard, you know, and he's also asking for help in any way you can. He's got a man up here with a bucket, you'll see him. That's for this guy right here for Leonard's rally. But what I was talking about living history and John, we're not going away. We're ancestors and descendants. This man right here, Pedro Prodog, was born in full battle in 1973 when we were being attacked by the United States Army. This young man here, 
22 years old. Has lived long enough, huh? 22. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> so I don't want to make you any older, right? You're right. You know, you'd be going crazy like me, but anyhow, you know. You know, because this guy's done it, and his mom, they did a, a movie on her, Lakota Woman. You know, so look for it on TNT, you know, to get a little dose of reality. But I just wanted to prove to you that it's living history. The struggle's still there. This guy was born into a struggle when the bullets were flying. That's what we're trying to get across to everybody in here. That we're not going away, you know. So I just wanted to introduce him. If he wanted to say anything, you know, I let him say it to you because I figured we have living history in our midst. We should at least listen, you know. And after that, it'll be Steve Robert do, you know. He works for the Leonard Powell Defense, uh, Defense Committee.